Oh, come on. You can do better than that. Put your hands together for the men singing. Come on, stand to your feet. Let them know that they did a good job. Put your hands together. Yes. Yes. Lord, I worship. I believe. Now, go on and put your hands together if you believe everything's going to be all right. Lord, I worship. I believe. Everything's going to be all right. When you really believe it, you add another syllable. Everything is going to be all right. Uh, good morning, church. It's good to be with you on this day. Those of you that don't know, you may have your seats for a quick second. I'm Reverend Derek Harris. Happy to be here with you all. Uh, I am excited about this word on this morning. Um, it's one that I've been praying over and spending some, some you know, time in. Uh, maybe I had you sit down too early because I'm going to ask you to stand back up. Yep, yep, go on and do it. We'll just, we'll just pretend like it didn't happen. Let me help you to get off your feet, though. Let me, let me just, just, cut, just cut across the field and point to our scripture for this morning. Our scripture for this morning, it's going to appear on, on the screen. It's coming to us from the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. And we'll be looking at verses 1. We'll do 1 through 5, okay? 1 through 5. On the NRSB, thank you. I appreciate y'all. Y'all act like you know me, huh? Uh, act like you know me a little bit. All right, good. All right, let's go on and jump into this. If then there is anything or rather any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy. Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interests of others. Let that same mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. Won't you pray with me? Gracious God, who is God, we thank you for this day. Ah, the day that you have made, the day that you are making. Lord, we pressed our way here into your house, from our house. Lord, we got up early this morning to come see about you. Come see about what you might be up to in our life, in this world, the invitation that you might even have before us. How we might live more fully into our purposes and into your kingdom. Lord, we need a word from you. Hide that preacher, man. Loose his lips that others may hear what you have given in that private place. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if I had to title today's message, I'd simply call it, There Goes the Neighborhood. <laughs> there goes the neighborhood. There goes the neighborhood. Why don't you do me this favor? I always wanted to do this. I never, I never done this, but I always wanted to do this. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, oh neighbor, rock them and shake them. No, 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 no. That's what you do. I said, I always wanted to do this. You know, that's when you grab them, you, you rock them and shake them. No, yeah. Shake them and rock them. <laughs> say neighbor, oh neighbor. I've been growing up in these Baptist churches my whole life, and I just see folks just <laughs> shake them and rock them. Right, right. Say, neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh, neighbor. I hope there's some neighbors in this hood. <laughs> if I had a title of message, I'd simply call it, There Goes the Neighborhood. All right. You know, while imprisoned uh, for spreading the gospel, Paul writes a letter to a church in a community that he helped to establish in the Roman colony called Philippi. And in this letter, Paul sets out to tackle four things. 
Uh, the last being the central notional motif. The, the, the last one being the central or being of central importance to him. His first point or his first thing he wants to tackle is he wants to thank the church of Philippi for their financial support. The second thing he wants to do is express his joy about how well they are doing as a community. The third thing he wants to do is he wants to calm any anxieties around their friend by the name of Epaphroditus, who had fallen ill. And fourth, here it is, and most important, he wants to encourage them to maintain and strengthen the unity of their community. You know, in five short verses, Paul captures the thrust of his whole letter. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being untied or rather united with Christ, if any comfort from love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness in compassion, then make my joy complete by being of a like mind, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the spirit, one in the mind, do nothing out of selfish ambitions or vain conceit. Instead, rather, but in humility, value others above yourself. Not just looking upon or for your own interest, but for and out the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, he says this, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus has for you. You see, through this passage, Paul informs the reader that selfish ambitions contradict the humility necessary for authentic engagement in Christian community. In other words, Paul is saying the Christian framework of the self is inextricably tied to our relationship with others. For Paul, there is no me without you. For Paul, there's no you without me. Put it another way, in the Christian faith, Paul understands that caring for our neighbor is both method and goal. Paul understands that love for our neighbor, mutuality, common concern is both method and goal of a empowered and empowering community. I'm already preaching. Paul understands that this unity thing is, uh, is the means and the end. Empowered for empowering community. You know, George uh, Flo Floro uh, Florosky, he's a prominent Orthodox, or rather was a prominent Orthodox theologian of the 20th century and a former professor at Harvard Divinity School in Princeton. He said it this way. He said, Christianity entered history as a new social order or rather a new social dimension. There was not only a message to be proclaimed and delivered, there was precisely a new community, a new community to which members were called and recruited to. Indeed, he says, fellowship was the basic category of Christian existence. You see, so when Paul writes this letter, he is aware of the cultural history of the region. When Paul writes this letter, he is familiar with the cultural norms of the Roman, the Greco-Roman world. He knows how easy it is for many to lean into selfish goals and personal gain, bias, desires for a power, and simply being worried about oneself. Paul is aware. He's aware that he is writing to a community in a region whose city's statements weren't shy about their agendas for domination. He's right into a people where he recognizes that these people aren't shy about their agendas, their goals, their aspirations, or their desires. The one that they scream from the rooftop and the ones that they hide underneath the bed where nobody's watching. He knows that this is also a community of people that have a desire for power, prestige, prominence, and domination. 
universal control. And because of this, he wants to inform the church in Philippi that the ways of Rome are unsustainable. He wants to tell them that the ways of empire aren't conducive to human flourishing. That the ways of empire are not the ways of Christian community. Paul understood the words of Jesus when he had talked to that young man and where he said, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all thy soul, with all your mind and all of your strength. This is the first and great commandment and the second is just like the first. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all of the law. In the prophets. In other words, Paul understood the gospel as the power, or rather has the power to revolutionize uh, social values, to reconcile conflict, to break down biases, and to modify motives. Former president of Morehouse and dean, and former dean of, and rather late in former president of Morehouse and late in former dean of Howard University School of Divinity, he once said it this way, Benjamin Elijah Mays, he said, the individual person is so significant that to do injury to the least worthy is to do injury to God. Jesus said it too. He said, what you do to the least of these, you do unto me. You see, Paul understood the power of being neighborly. Paul gets it, but do we? Paul gets it, but do you get it? Do you get it? Do we get it? You see, when Yesenia and I, uh, that's my wife. <laughs> when Yesenia and I first moved into our house, we had only been married a couple of months. We went in with the intention of looking for a house that we thought the two of us could grow into as a young family. Uh, we chose a home at the end of a cul-de-sac, a dead-end cul-de-sac, because we wanted a home with about three bedrooms, an office for my studies, spacious backyard, and we didn't immediately care too much about the school districts, well, because none of us had planned, or either of us, not, I, <laughs> Let me go and tell the truth since I'm here, you know. <laughs> I didn't plan on having, you know, any children until the student loans were paid off. <laughs> and you know what? I, 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 we, we, uh, listen, I don't know how we paid off those student loans. <laughs> those things got paid off so fast. Uh, well, we wanted some, something. We wanted a house that wasn't going to be too far from family. We, we uh, wanted a place where our potential family at the time could play in the cul-de-sac and ride the little bikes and scrape and scrape and scrape the knees and, and you know, have the, with the, uh, the uh, family cook, cookouts and, you know, do all, of the, do all of the neighborly things. And like most people, we were looking and hoping. We were hoping and searching, searching to be a part of a close-knit community. And we wanted to belong to a community of engaged and friendly neighbors. Well, you see how I set that up? Well, uh, well, well, shortly after moving in, I recall being in the front yard doing some yard work. I was uh, edging up the, um, the grass. When one of my new neighbors, a recently retired a white woman in her late 660s, she saw me from outside her living room win window peeking, you know, peeking through. Uh, and I had already seen her before she saw me. Uh, and she gave me a wave and then she walked over to our yard and she gave me a passive grin. And she said, <laughs> yeah. She said, <laughs> she said, welcome to the hood. That's what she said. That's what she said. That's, ooh, yep, that's what she said. That's what she told me. 
Welcome to the hood. <laughs> Needless to say, I was taken back. I was taken back by the words of this elderly woman whose husband rode a motorcycle and they were very keen on American flags. <laughs> yeah, my, my. I was taken back. I was taken back. Uh, but I wasn't taken back because she used the word hood. I was taken back because I knew what the hood meant. I'm familiar with the paradoxes and the dichotomies of that hood hold uh, under, or rather within under-resourced and over-exploited communities. I'm familiar with the hood. My first gated community was in the hood. I mean, there was a, there was a gate. You couldn't get in there if you leave your name. That was a gated community. Yep, that was a gate. Yeah. You know, I am familiar with these paradoxes. I, I understand the word hood. I know what the word hood means in the communities that have been subjected to what a uh, uh, professor of African American studies at Princeton University, uh, Eddie Glaude, calls in his book, Democracy in Black. I understand the American value gap, right? I understand it. You see, so it isn't lost on me that her use of African-American in common vernacular uh, wasn't simply a greeting of hospitality and welcome. It wasn't a simple salutation. Instead, it was a racialized announcement that the presence of my family violated her ideological commitments, her ideological delusions, concerning the spaces and places our brown and black bodies should inhabit. You see, she didn't know I went to Princeton. <laughs> she, she, ain't, she ain't know. <laughs> so, so after her remarks, I thought of a few myself. And then I chose not to say those. Then I chose not to say those, right? But instead, I said some other ones. I said, well, I hope there's some neighbors in this hood. I hope there's some neighbors in this hood. This is a neighborhood, right? You see, aren't you proud of me? I had so many words. <laughs> Man, I had words about her mama. I had words about her ugly little dog. I had words about all the places that she could go. Listen, li listen, I even had words about places my feet could go. <laughs> I had some words, but I didn't use them. You see, deep within her thinly veiled comments was, was a hidden thought, a phrase likely uttered by some of our, by, um, by really them as soon as they saw our moving trucks hit the driveway. It's a phrase often used by longtime residents of a community upon seeing a new family or tenant come in or move in. It's one, uh, it is a phrase that is used whenever there seems to be a contradiction of socio-historical homogeneity in the community. This phrase that is commonly, em this is a phrase that is commonly employed whenever there is a perceived threat to the status quo or the historical way of being. You know it, there goes the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at its core, that phrase doesn't have much to do with the neighborhood at all. Instead, it's demonstrative of an ideology. 
It is used to convey uh, disapproval of newcomers, their values, their language, their cultural heritage, their ethnic identities, and their way of being. It's a phrase that carries with it subtle and overt connotations of xenophobia, bias, and fear of one's growing proximity to difference in diversity. There goes the neighborhood. And at its core, it is ultimately a criticism about space and place. I'm teaching now. You see, David Leong, PhD of practical theology in his book entitled Race in Space, he says this, quote, he says, space, it is that geographical location we all currently occupy. Oh, but place, on the other hand, is demonstrative of the constructs and values a society associates with a particular way of being over another. In other words, he's saying, in most societies, people are assigned a space based on their place within a social hierarchy. That is to say, they are given, partic given a particular status, a social weight, a value based on arbitrary constructs like race, class, gender, and sexuality. And then because of such constructs, particular people groups are assigned spaces that they may inhabit and spaces that they may not. There goes the neighborhood. Church, what are the spaces and places that God is calling you to transform for the sake of community? Church, what are the spaces and places that God is calling you to transform for the sake of maintaining and strengthening and growing in unity? What are those spaces and places that God is calling you to tear down in the community that God is calling you to build up? I'm preaching again now. Church, what are the spaces and places that God is calling you to reshape? for the purposes of unity and community. You see, I recognize that this may have been my unique experience, but I believe that this is a story that belongs to all of us. It's a story that belongs to all of us. At some point, one point or another, we all desire to be in neighborly community, to be in a neighborly community guided by mutual concern. And what the New Testament scholar of Monia Stubbs, she calls the mindset of other interestedness. A mindset where you are interested in somebody else. Listen to that. That's the call of this text that Paul gives us on this morning. You see, at some point or another, we are all in search of community. At some point or another, we are all in search of connection. At some point, one point or another, we are all in search, seeking, longing after a sense of belonging. At some point in this journey that we call life traveling at the speed of now, we desire for places and spaces where our souls can rest. We desire for places in spaces where our safety guards can come down. We desire for spaces in places where we might experience the luxury or the privilege, better yet, undo the Western idealization, the right of rest. Whether it's the first day of school and you're trying to figure out where you're going to sit in the lunchroom, we all want to know where we belong. Whether it's you for the first time being that college aptly, uh, Kent, as a new or first generation college student trying to figure out where you're going to take your next steps for the future. You're trying to figure out where you belong. Maybe it's the person that is making life decisions about where, how, or with whom they're going to spend the rest of their life. If we are all invariably in search of safe harbors of acceptance and anchorage. A sincere community, connectivity, mutual concern, a sense of connection. These are all chief concerns of the human condition. 
And this is the reason why socially vulnerable boys and girls in our black and browns communities can be convinced to join street gangs that do nothing but terrorize, brutalize, and destroy, and devastate the lives of their closest families and friends simply because they long to be touched, to be held, to be hauled on to. Connection. Somebody to come and see about them. Somebody that knows their name. Somebody that has their address. A place where they can go of mutual proximity to dream and desire. These are the reasons why our South and Central American brothers and sisters will travel thousands of miles to find refuge by caravan or coyote. Simply to forge a future for their families. Because they look for a place to belong, that has resources, that has, that has privilege and pathways for more than what society might say about them. What are the spaces and places that God is calling you to tear down and to build up? Tear down the walls of misogyny and tear and build up the walls of community. Tear down the walls of patriarchy and build up the walls or rather the uh, build something. You know where I'm trying to go? I'm in a preaching moment. Huh? Tear them down, build them up. Tear them down, build them up. Tear them down, build them up. Tear down the walls of patriarchy. Uplift the cries of unity and inclusiveness. We all are made for interconnectedness and interdependency. As creatures created by a triune God, we are made for community. We are made not only for, but made from community. As a triune God who says, let us make humankind in our image, that means we are made from community. And we're made for community. We are made for interconnectedness and interdependency. Creatures created by a triune God were made for community. Church, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh neighbor. I hope there's some neighbors in this hood. Hope there's some neighbors in this hood. You see, the selfish ambitions of what Bell Hooks calls dominator culture. I love Bell Hooks. She, selfish, am, selfish ambitions are what uh, Bell Hooks calls dominator culture. It is a violent establishment. This dominator culture, it cracks communities, it fractures families, and it destroys difference. But in kingdom community, scarcity is a lie. In the community and kingdom of God, scarcity is a lie. There is enough for everybody's needs, not everybody's greeds. In the kingdom community, scarcity is a lie. In the kingdom community, selfish ambition is delegitimized. In the kingdom community, the inter, um, there is a interdependency is not only the way of life, it is the way to life in Christ until life everlasting. Oh, that was good. I'll say it again. Interdependency is the way of life to life in Christ until life everlasting. In dominator culture, power is hoarded, voices are silenced, and conflict is fueled. But in kingdom community, power is shared and every voice is valued and reconciliation is the goal. Uh, in fact, this is what was precisely on the minds of, of, uh, of King, King in the SCLC and uh, Miriam Wright 
when they made a intentional shift away from nearly touching on civil rights and moving toward a, uh, a global movement. You've heard of it, right? This poor people's campaign. They, uh, they uh, recognized that in order to truly do what they wanted to do, they had to revolutionize and refocus and reimagine their vision of what inclusivity really meant. And they said that the actual ultimate concern is not just making sure that people get to the voting booths, that they're treated right. It doesn't matter if you're, tre if you're treated the same in a, in a society that still is based off of the lie of patriarchy, misogyny, whose bodies have worth, weight, and, dig and, dig and dignity. In that case, equality is still damnation. And so they decided to make a move toward what they call the poor people's campaigns at the interest or rather at the insights of a attorney by the name of Miriam Wright. And Miriam Wright and other members of the SLC and including King on that September day in 1967 in Virginia decided then to say we're going to shift this thing. And they said what is the actual ultimate reality that is suffering around the world? And that's when they say it's actually a economic issue and I don't know who you are and somebody that Andrew Yang was on top of things talking about a um, a, a universal uh, remember remember this a universal income but I want to tell you that that was what King had talked about back in 1967 a universal income because he recognized truly what was at the heart and what he said and if you can't give these people jobs then we must give them income that was King. That wasn't Andrew Yang. That was King. I'm, I'm teaching now. <laughs> there goes the neighborhood. There goes the neighborhood. You know, my son, Lil Weston, Weston Stone Harris, Weston Stone Harris, WSH, his initials our, our homage to the fact that we're from Washington State, but he was born in Washington, D.C. I thought of that. I thought of that. December 24th, I came up with it. I came up with it. Right there. That was a lot of work. He was born in February. That was seven months. <laughs> but Weston, one of the things he likes to do, first thing he does is wake up at 6 o'clock. <clears throat> for the fourth time, but when he's up for the rest of the day, the first thing we do is we turn on this new, uh, it's not new, it's been around for maybe like four or five years, but this YouTube show that he likes. And maybe you've heard of it, it's called Gracie's Corner. You, who knows Gracie's Corner? I'm so tired of that girl. <laughs> I can't stand that little girl. <sighs> Gracie's Corner is this YouTube show it's actually really cool, and I, and I catch myself listening and trying to, and like, singing the songs with them. But it is, essentially, it is a uh, kid show on YouTube, and she takes old nursery rhymes, her and her dad, who actually started it. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but her and her dad started it during the, pan, during the pandemic, and her dad is actually a PhD, but he also has these skill sets in music and all, and so her dad then said, hey, let's take some old nursery rhymes and let's redo them right, to uh, some hip hop, you know, kind of like beat. And Weston just there, you know, six, six in the morning, he's just, and in, in, the, in the first song that, that comes on is that, is that morning one, what is it? You, who, who knows? Good morning, how's, how's it go again? Come on, you guys know this show. Listen, I have one of those voices that sounds nice on pictures. Okay. You get me in a steel frame, boy, I tell you, I'm singing. Right. But anyhow, what they, what they essentially do is they take these old nursery rhymes and then they spin them. And so when I was, think, 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 I was thinking on this message, and I, <clears throat> I'm not going to sing. Some of y'all thought, no, 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 no. But what I want to do is I want to take that old, that old damning and hateful rhetoric of there goes the neighborhood. And I wanna flip that thing. Right. And I wanna turn it on its head. 
And so that wherever we see Christian or kingdom community doing Christian and kingdom work, we are able to say proudly and loudly, there goes the neighborhood. Whenever we reach out and we feed those that are hungry, like we do here every Saturday, you know what I say? There goes the neighborhood. Whenever we are able to mentor uh, and uh, help young folks experience adult healthy relationships, you know what I say? There goes the neighborhood. There goes kingdom community. Whenever I see somebody struggling and I see Christians and people responding, I say, there goes the neighborhood. There goes kingdom community. There goes Christian culture. There goes kingdom culture. Whenever I see somebody down and out, I want somebody to say, there goes the neighborhood. Church, I come by this morning to simply tell you that you are the neighbors. You are, where are the neighbors? You are the neighbors. We all want community. We all want connectivity. We all want proximity. But it's time for us to level up and lean in so that when they see us, we say, they say, there goes the neighborhood. There goes those, there goes those folks that follow the way. There goes those people that love the Lord. There goes those folks that are concerned about their neighbor. There they go. There goes those feeding the homeless. All over this country, we've got students right now protesting against the genocide, the danger, the, the brutality, the indignity, the, the inhumanity that's happening in Gaza. And you know what I say? I say, there goes the neighborhood. There goes the neighborhood standing for what's right. There goes the neighborhood marching and protesting. There goes the neighborhood in the voting booth. There goes the neighborhood in the school board meeting. There goes the neighborhood in the city council. There goes the neighborhood running for office. There goes the neighborhood signing up and giving scholarships that students might be able to be and become all that God has for them. There goes the neighborhood. There goes Christian community. There goes kingdom culture. Ah, there goes the neighborhood, and I'm done. There goes the neighborhood. There goes kingdom community. Wherever low love shows up in public, there goes the neighborhood. There they go. There they go. You know, I believe we're all standing. You know, I believe that there are some people here today that you came here because you need that proximity. I believe there's some people who came to church on this morning because you said, I, I can't do this thing by myself. I need brotherly love, sisterly love, neighborly affection. I need mutual concern. I tried this, this thing don't work. I'm going through right now. I'm struggling. I need help. I need somebody that's willing to come and see about me, to ask about my family, ask about my day. You came here because you know that you need that. Proximity to community. You need proximity. You know, and don't even lie and say you don't because the truth is every single one of us do. I need it. You need it. We need it. And so if you did come, with that on your mind or with that on your heart, just, I want you to know that, that you're in good company, that you are in good company. We all need somebody to come see about us. We are all interdependent creatures. We gotta stop believing the lie of invulnerability and self-sufficiency. We cannot do this by ourselves. You were never created to. That's simply what our country and nation tries to demand of you, but, but you were never self-sufficient. I don't care about your degrees. I don't care about your account. You were never able to do this on your own. We are made for community. If that's you, won't you come? Won't you come? Won't you come? Doors of the church are open. Won't you come? Won't you come? Make, make your move. We want to pray with you. We want to talk with you. We want to sit with you. We want to show you that we will show up. We will show up. Oh, won't you come?